Okay, I would like to start with one sentence, and uh, that is that if you want, uh, you have to go wholeheartedly in, into anything in order to achieve anything that is worth having. And I believe that if we are here today, all of us as implantologists, as doctors, is because we have passion and we love what we do. And the same thing we see in the company, the BB Dental Company, that is the love for dentistry, the love, the passion for what we do, that is giving us the possibility, gave us the possibility to have better products and to be here today. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to summarize all the steps of the BB Dental because it was already done by so far. Uh, and I'm part of it since very late, so I'm not part of the first steps, I'm more part of the last steps, and today I would like to introduce to you one of the last products, that is the pterygoid implant. Uh, just a few words, this is the clinic where I have the pleasure to work in Poznan, uh, with Professor Enzelek, he's the owner of the, of the clinic, and the where we use the implants, of course, Bibidenta. And uh, if you ask me how BB Dental changed my way of working, because this is the thing that we should address today, in my opinion, is uh, it gave me a completely wo different workflow. Thanks to the cooperation with Alan, thanks to the cooperation with Simone, I have a pleasure to use many different products and different solutions for my patients. This is our operating room in the, in the office. What it didn't change, however, is the way we approach implantology. And before we talk about pterygoid implants, before we talk about uh, Yuxta implants, I would like to tell you that there is one thing that I always keep in mind, and what I keep in mind is the aim. So why the patient is coming to our clinic? And the thing is only one. The patient wants to restore the function, okay, also the aesthetic, but the first thing, our goal is to restore the function of a patient, to, to give them the teeth. They're not interested in the way we're going to do it, they're just interested that we are going to do that. And to do that, there's something that we need to keep in mind. And first of all, we are working with patient, we are working with bone, so we need to keep in mind the biology. And uh, if we keep in mind the biology, we also will have a long-term stability. That's what the patient is asking us. We are looking at the research with, uh, uh, we are always looking for long follow-ups. Why? Because our restoration, they need to stain them out for a very long time. And uh, so if we are, Going back to think about the biology, of course, we are working most of all with the bone. And when we are working with the bone, we are talking about the quantity and we are talking about the quality of a bone. And if we are going to focus later on on the posterior maxilla, even if it's not the deficient bone, we are always work talking about a bone that is a D3, D4. We have seen yesterday this is bone that is not good quality. We don't like to work with such a bone. And uh, of course, we have an interface, the gingiva. So we have two different complexes that we need to address when we are placing our implants and we are placing our restorations. And uh, uh, the gingiva is the part where we have a connection between the implants and our uh, abutment. So it's extremely important for us and we need to respect both of them while thinking about our restorations. We were talking yesterday uh, with some colleagues of what kind of bone we have in our patients that unfortunately most of our patients when they're coming to our clinic they already present a class 4 class 6 so we have a basal bone or we have a knife edge type of bone so we have a lot of problems we don't have the easy cases most of the times like in the classification we have bone type 2 for example for placing the implants so we needed to find a different way and uh, why do we have such a bone in our patient what happens the fact is that when you, we are extracting the teeth, and this article for me is the best I could find, is that we are losing bone. And we are losing bone no matter what we are doing. We read a lot about uh, bone regeneration, we read a lot about socket preservation. I don't do it anymore after this article. Why? Because we know what it came out is if we don't have a daily stress on our implants, on our teeth, we are going to lose bone. No matter if we do the socket preservation. So, what we need to do, if we have the chance immediately to place the implant, this is the best way to preserve a certain amount of bone. Otherwise, if we are extracting the teeth, we are losing a lot of bone. And we know that after six months, one year, it's normal to find around three millimeters of bone loss even. So, a lot of complications, a lot of things that we need to overcome somehow when we are treating our patients. And, of course, 
this is not the first day, so we have different solution for the posterior maxilla, one of which we know everybody is the sinus lift procedure. We will hear even about it afterwards, but we already heard even yesterday, so it's a very common procedure. We can do GBR with grafting with autogenous, allogenous material, this is up to your preference. We can use tilted implants, all on four concepts, all on six concepts. And I will tell you, I don't usually practice the all on four concept. For me, I don't like to have big cantilevers in my restorations, I to have cantilevers in general. My professor was teaching me this way for the, for the prostodontics. Otherwise, a different solution can be the zygomatic implants. However, all these procedures, of course, they are related to some kind of complications. And uh, what are the complications that we, have we are facing when we are doing these procedures? Well, first of all, if we are doing the sinus lift, we might have a chance of a tearing of a sinus membrane. Uh, otherwise, we can have a bone graft that is flowing inside the sinus. Let's remember that the epithelium that is inside the sinus is trying to push normally the mucus up. So this is the same thing that can happen to our graft. This is why our, sometimes our graft, we find it, especially if we break, break the membrane on the top of the sinus instead in, of the lower part. We can have rejection of a graft. We can have uh, some kind of a, a reaction to it. And the other thing we can do if you are using tilted implants, we can have screw, uh, screw loosening, even though we know that with the BB tenter we are using the, the Morse connection, so even without the screw, the implant will ke be kept in place. And last and not least, if we are using zygomatic implants, this kind of procedure, we might need the general anesthesia, not necessarily, but sometimes, and we might have some disproportionate, the, some not favorable position of the implants from the prosthetic point of view. So, who better than this guy? Today we are here at the Lamborghini, and Mr. Lamborghini said, when he started doing the cars, that I need, I had to try something new. And every time there's something new, I'm very excited, I want to try it. And so I went back, we went back, and we started thinking, are, do we have to create bone? Do we have to work with bone grafts? Do we have to do something new, or we can use what we have? So we go back, we go back to the first step, and we go back to the anatomy. We take the picture from the first year of dentistry, the skull. And we start looking at the maxilla, and it's a quite a big bone, because it goes from the teeth, we find it in the orbit, it's a huge bone. And the question is, we are usually using till the tooth number seven or tooth number six. What about the tuber area? Well, let's define the tuberosity. At this point, I, we don't have too much time, so I don't want to go into detail because it's an area that all of us know, but it's the, the posterior part of the maxilla. However, the part of bone is very weak, is a D3, D4 most of the times, and the posterior boundary is the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. And then the, uh, posteriorly, immediately, we find the pterygoid process of a sphenoid bone. So the question is, if we have some pneumatization of a sinus, if we have some resorption, can we just place a shorter implant in the area number six and number five, place an implant in the tuber, and make a restoration? Of course, we can do it. So we solved the problem. Now we can go home. There's nothing else to say. I'm sorry to break the news, once again, but if we start reading any articles, and we find a million of them, we will find out that the maxillary tuberosity is the least desirable place to place an implant. So we need, once again, to look for another bone, to look for something new. And what could be that? Well, let's go back, let's look at our skull. Let's look at the atrophic maxilla, like in this case, so the kind of cases that we find in our patient. And we take another anatomical view. And this time, from the tuber maxilla, we are going a little bit backwards. And what we'll find? We will see the lateral pterygoid plate, and we will find the pyramidal process of a palatine bone. So, the question is, can we go even more backwards with our implant? I would like at this point to use a few words also to show you, and I will show more in detail afterwards, this area. So the pterygopalatine fossa, because what we see here crossing is the maxillary artery, yes? And in a second we will come back to this point. But it's very visible on this slide, this is why I want to show you. And when I say going backwards, I mean, can we still place an implant close to the tuber area, but engaging in the pterygoid process? And the answer is yes, actually. So,
To be more clear, I'm not engaging the lateral pterygoid plate. However, this is the model of a real patient that we treated uh, this year. We have been printing. The, uh, Alan made a fantastic job. It looks fantastic, the model. Very smooth, yes? So if I want to place an implant in this area, in the posterior maxilla, here I had no chance to go into the sinus. The, the patient is a heavy smoker. I will show you this case afterwards. It's a heavy smoker. He already has implants in the premaxilla. He doesn't want to have an overdenture. So if we're going backwards to try to engage the pterygoid plate, this is how we will place our burr. We go backwards, around 50 degrees. And if you want to see, in, let's say, in 3D, this is how it looks like our burr. How is drilling from the tuber maxilla backwards to the pterygoid bone. And don't get me wrong, once again, let's take the, the skull and let, let's look at it from a different view. So now we're looking from down up. So what we want to do is to start from the tuber maxilla, from the area the 7, 8, going posterior immediately and engaging this area of a pterygoid plate. So if it's difficult to imagine, now I will show you. Just remember that the lateral pterygoid plate and the medial pterygoid plate, this is not the place that we want to touch, especially the lateral one, because it's very weak. In case we engage the medial one, it could be a better problem, yes? But we really have to be in between. And when I mean in between, I mean like that. In this case, we didn't have to engage very high in the, in, in the pterygoid process, but sometimes we go much higher. But what we did is starting from the tuber, going backwards, and medially, we could engage our bone. So this is a different solution. This is a, we are using bone that is already present. We don't have to invent anything, yes? So we go back to our scheme, and we see, once again, we see the maxilla, we see the uh, pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and we see the uh, pterygoid process. And our implant is going through, three, uh, sorry, through the three bones engaging in three bones. And now, when we're engaging to these bones, we are not anymore in a soft bone. We are not in the tuber, because we're going through three of them. We're going through the, the pyramidal process. We are going into a very dense bone. And this is the real definition of this area. There is always eight or nine millimeters of very dense bone. So we place back our implant in the front, and then we can do our bridge. And this is a different solution. We are not doing sinus lift. We are not waiting for healing. We are putting our bridge. We can even perform immediate loading in this case. And this is how it looks like in 3D, our implant. If it's just to be clear where it's going to engage, because most of the times the question is, where is exactly going this implant? This is how it's going. I would like to tell you that it was my idea that I was one of the first ones to say, but it's completely wrong. This implant was the first time that it was uh, described was in 1989. I was born that year. So, and we were already talking about the pterygoid implant. Now it changed the way that we are approaching because we know much more about the size, about the length. But Tulane's name was already publishing in 1989 this technique. And what it came out is in the atrophic maxilla, there's always a preservation of at least 80% of the bone. This bone is not resorbing. This is the big difference. We know the typical aspect of an old person is resorbing the maxilla, is resorbing the mandible, but the rest of the face is staying in place. And this is because this kind of bone is not resorbing. And this is the truth, that there's always sufficient bone to place an implant that is from 13 to 20 millimeters. So this is a solution for us. It's something that I think we should keep in our bag of solutions. However, before going forward and looking at some cases, what we have to do, we definitely have to talk about some surgical landmarks. And this is what I was temporal you before, that if we start from the infratemporal fossa going to the nasal cavity, we are going to engage the pterygomaxillary fissure, pterygopalatine fossa, and sphenopalatine foramen. And this is, I think, that we need to remember why. Because during our surgery, when we are opening the flap, the first thing that we are going to do is going to localize the pterygomaxillary fissure. Why? Because in this part, we have very sensitive uh, vessels and very sensitive nerves. So first thing first, you localize the infratemporal, uh, the um, pterygomaxillary fissure. At this point, you also find the lateral pterygoid plate, you touch it, you feel it, so that you know exactly where you're going to find the fossa where you want to place your implant. And why do we want to localize 
the fissure and so the pterygopalatine fossa is because inside we have a foramen rotunda. The foramen rotunda, we have a V2, we have a, uh, the, the maxillary nerve of the trigemina. So we want to avoid it. Inside we have a pterygopalatine ganglion. As you see, it's a quite complicated area and we want to be as far as possible from problems. And not least, even more important to us, not about the nerve, it's about the artery. Here we have a final part of the maxillary artery. So we know that the, of the, of the, in the, max, the maxillary artery is the final part of internal carotid. So it's a big blood supply. However, it's, you can ask me, so is it safe to place the pterygoid implant? I will tell you that it's quite safe because usually the maxillary artery is crossing around 25 millimeters from the beginning of a pterygoid plate. So we don't have a big problem with that. What the vessel that can cause us a little bit more problem is the posterior superior alveolar artery that is crossing down. So it's basically parallel to our implant. So we need to localize this artery either during the surgery and during the planning to avoid it. Or we can have some complications, some bleeding. And this is how it looks like inside the fossa. So here we have the maxillary artery, yes, the infraorbital, and this is the descending palatine greater artery, yes. And this is the one that we need to avoid. If you might go home and read a little bit more about this implant today, you might get a little bit confused because you will find four different names. One you in the, when you will check the posterior maxilla, you will find the tuberosity implants, and we already addressed them. We know what is the difference. You will find the tuberosity and pyramidal process implants. So we already know. It depends on the kind of bone that we are going to cross when we are going to place our implant. Our goal, however, what we know now that we should use, because Razor wrote this book around 20 years ago, is that if we want to have a good stability of implants in this area, we have to put through the tuberosity, pyramidal process, and the pterygoid process. And this journey that is doing our bird, that is doing our implant, is the same journey that we feel on our bird. So when you are going to drill to place this implant, you will have different feelings for each bone that you are going to cross. Because let's be honest, this is a, a lot about feeling placing this implant, because we have no visibility, we are almost blind, we know to be sure about our planning. And, uh, when we have a tuberosity and we want to engage the plates, what kind of angulation we should have with our burr? This is the question. And this is what was answered by Yamamura many years ago. He made a very interesting study to know what kind of angulation we need to find to engage the plate. And what we have, and I will show you from our study that we have the same results, is that we should place our implant with an angulation from the Frankfurt plane around 76 degrees. And buccolingually around 17 degrees. As we said before, this fossa is located posteriorly and medially. And yes, and medially. And instead, in the, when we have a dentulous patients, we have to, we have a lesser angle, we are around 67 degrees and 14 degrees buccolingually. Why there is a difference in angle? We already said the part of the maxilla that is uh, resorbing, the 80% is staying. And this is why. If we have a dentulous patient, we will have a bigger inclination of our implant. So if we want to summarize up what kind of angulation we need to keep for our implant, from the buccolingual view, we need to have a 15 degrees. And instead, when we go from the uh, posteriorly, we need to have at least 45 degrees. It can go up to 75. If we find the literature, we will find that if we want to place these implants, we need to stay with an angulation that it will be from 45 to 75 degrees. It's very difficult to calculate this angle. This is why one of the biggest advice that I have is to print out the model, to see it in your hands, so you can see the journey that we'll have, you will have to do with your burr. If you want, you can even drill it, you can even try it where, in which part you want to place it. And uh, as you see, this burr that we are using here is a 4.7 millimeters in width. So I would like to now to present to you a retrospective study. And this retrospective study is about basically anatomy and the safety of using these implants. And in this study, what they concluded, it's very interesting, and that is that 
the bone density of the ptagoid process is always greater than the density of a tuberosity. And this is why we need to engage this bone. That's why it's not enough to stay in the tuberosity. And uh, therefore, this is a great place to anchor an implant. What is even important is that they were studying the amount of bone. So how much bone do we have in this area? And luckily, most of the times, the junction between the maxilla and the, and the pterygoid process has enough width to place the implant because this bone is not resorbing. And most of all, we have the height. We see here the uh, fissure. And we also have the height of at least 13 millimeters. And we know that from here to the artery, we have 25 millimeters to the maxillary artery. So if you get this one, this means that something went completely wrong. If you want to see it in x-ray, once again, how it looks like, this is our implant, starting from the tuber maxilla, going backwards to the plates, engaging the plate, and the 15 degrees buccolingually. So once again, this is if we could see our patient after the procedure from backwards, this is how it would look like, yes, when our implant is engaged the cortical bone. And you can ask me, why do you like so much to place the implants in this area? And here we need to address some few steps of the, of the maxillofacial surgery, and, 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 but in general, the transmission of the forces to the skull. And that is that the posterior maxilla, so the pterygoid process, is a pillar. So it is physiologically designed to distribute the forces of mastication up to the neurocranial. So even though we are placing an implant which is tilted, so I told you before that I don't like so much the tilted implants, yes, but then I'm doing it. I like to place these tilted implants because they are transmitting the forces physiologically to the skull. So these implants are very safe. This is an area that is designed to, for heavy forces. And if anybody went through a surgical uh, training has seen this picture on the first day when we're, st we're studying the fracture of the skulls. And this is how the forces are distributed to the face. This is how you study where it will be the fracture in the skull. And uh, we need to, at this point, I want to focus on, three, on, on uh, the distribution of the vertical forces on the skull. And we have three buttresses. The three buttresses are the nasomaxillary or canine, that it goes from the canine area to the glabella together with the palate. The zygomatic maxillary arch, that is the same one that you are engaging when you're doing the zygomatic implants. And the pterygomaxillary buttress. So you see, these three areas are designed to transmit the forces vertically up. To the skull. So this, this is the area that we can use it. And remember about these ones, because these ones are coming back in the last part of the presentation today, when I will show you the different construction, yes, about the Euxta implants. So at this point, we know what, how to distribute the forces. And I want to summarize a little bit about the difference about the pterygoid implants and the tuberosity, but I think it's quite clear that uh, uh, the, the type of bone that they are engaging, so we are working in a hard bone, the, we, are different, we are working with a different angulation because we are placing an implant about 45, 60 degrees instead of a straight one. So it's, this is a big difference. But another big difference for me is about the visualization. And it's a visual, it, then we are placing the tuberosity implant, of course, we have a full view of the surgical field. Instead, when we are going backwards, when we are doing with the pterygoid implants, we are blind. So we need to know exactly where we are going and what we are doing. And we will get an implant like that, looking from down up. However, now we clarify between tuberosity and we clarify it from pterygoid. I need to clarify something more, the zygomatic implants, because many times when I talk about pterygoid, they tell me how oh, you do the zygomatic implant. I'm not placing the zygomatic implants. However, from this picture, it's very clear the difference. The difference that they have is that they are engaging in different bones. One is engaging the uh, rhomboid process of the vaccilla, while the second one is going to the pterygoid plate. Even though they are different, we already know that they have something in common. So think about that. These both are implants and bones that they are not going to resorb. These are bones that are stable, and I've shown you before, these are bones that are transmitting the forces to the skull. However, if we take a lateral view of our patient, we will see that the difference is clearly visible. So 
how to place this implant. Let's go further to the clinical part of our lecture. And uh, this is the kit that we have in the office. This is the kit that you have present here. As was said already yesterday very clearly from Alan, this is a kit that can be used for guided surgery, that can be used for uh, standard surgery. The only thing that I'm sorry you didn't say yesterday, yes, is that we have a special instrument in here that is called tester. So when we use this tester, we are able to feel exactly and check the distance at which we broke the cortical plate of a pterygoid. Because when you are drilling, as shown you before, we really need to feel the breakage of a cortical bone of the pterygoid process. And sometimes it's difficult to see how deep we are. So we have a special instruments where we have the feeling when we are crossing this breakage and we can measure the length of our implant. Length of our implant, let's see also how it looks like this implant. And this implant is what uh, in Arabic country they will say Jara Jamil. Yes, it's a beautiful implant. And uh, here we have it. Let's not talk too much around it. And you see the topography of this implant is very different. It differs from the normal implants that we are using from BB Dental. And this is because of a different bone that is going to engage. So we have a part of the cortical bone and a part from the spongious bone. And this is because, as I told you before, we are crossing different types of bones. So this implant, I've seen some pterygoid implants which have only one topography. For me, it's a known sense. I like this implant because it's changing. And look out what we have here. We have the final part that is polished. And I'll show you in the case why it's extremely important. Because this part might be in contact with the soft tissues. And if we are talking about sizes, I'm sorry, but sizes, we have one diameter, 4.7 millimeters. And in length, we can only have 16 and 18. Well, you can ask me, can I just place a smaller diameter, 4 millimeters, 3.5 3 millimeters, we have 16 millimeters length. Why should I buy this implant? Well, this is after many studies. We know that 4.7 and not 4.5, not 4.2, not 4 is the diameter that will distribute correctly the forces. Because as I told you, this is a buttress. This is getting a lot of forces from mastication. When the implants were smaller, they were breaking. And our goal, we said at the beginning for any kind of implant, is long-term stability. So implant must be 4.7 millimeters. Any length 16 and 18. Why no longer? It's for safety. Because if we have too long implants, we might get into pterygopalatine fossa if we are not safe, if we are not very careful. So let's take a look at the patient. This is a patient coming to our office. He wanted to rehabilitate the posterior area. He had a bridge made a few years before that couldn't stay up. I, I couldn't imagine how for three years they could stay with on such preparation. And the problem is that he has pain in the posterior area. This tooth is painful, this tooth is painful. So as with every patient, we have to come out with a plan, and the plan is to perform some extraction. Also, the wisdom tooth had some problems. We wanted to extract it. And the idea was to place five implants. And of course, afterwards, the crown on the implants this is what the patient wants. So here we have to make some decisions what to do. And one option would be to do two-stage approach, augmentation and then implantation, or we can go ahead and do a sinus elevation and implantation simu simultaneously. But I didn't tell you something. This patient had previous problem with the sinuses when he was younger, and he said, sinus sleep for me is not an option. Okay? So maybe we can go ahead and try with some pterygoid implants to find the support in the posterior part of the maxilla. And this is, of course, the what was our decision. So we go to the day of the surgery. Here we have our wisdom tooth in place. We can see the healing after the extraction of the period tooth that I've shown you before. So we do the extraction of the tooth. Are traumatic. We don't open the flap. We are very gentle. Then finally, we open the flap and we start drilling. So as for the every protocol, we are starting with the lens drill. Then we go in with the pilot drill. We are enlarging. When we get to this one, we are already drilling about the 3.5, so here there's no turning back. And then we get the final drill, it's 4.7 millimeters in diameter, so the implants is around 4.6, the drill, there's no turning back. If you make a mistake here, you can close the flap. There will be no chance to place the implant afterwards. And here we have our osteotomy in place. And our implant. We are going to place our implant and engage 
the bone and we will feel it very hard. When we are eating the cortical bone with our implant, it becomes very hard. If you're going to tap on it, you will feel like an implant that is super osteointegrated. integrated So what to do? Afterwards, we place medially the standard implant. And because of a good stability, of course, immediately we put the peak healing abutment. And we are ready for suture in this place. Because I didn't show you in this picture, I'm sorry, but around this implant, I put some biomaterial. And watch out, I place a seven millimeters healing abutment because in this area we have a very big connective tissue. Finish one side, we can go to the next one. So in the second area, we don't have a guide, we don't have a wisdom tool that's guiding us in the position where we want to go, so we need to find by ourselves. We open the flap. After opening the flap, we visualize, we find the fossil, we the perigonal maxillary fissure, we find the bone, where we find where we want to start with our osteotomy. We perform the osteotomy, and of course, we need to find some support medially, so we place two more implants, which they needed some bone regeneration. And we use the Nova bone materials with the collagen membrane. We are ready to suture on the second side, and also in this, guy, in the, in this case, the healing abutment. It's extremely important in these implants to put, put the healing abutment, because going back in this area, looking for the implant, might be quite challenging. So how does it look like radiographically? This is how it looks like. This is how our patient is leaving the office without touching the sinuses. That for him was the extremely important thing. He would have never agreed to any other treatment. And most important, big difference with the sinus lift, we didn't do the immediate loading only because this teeth had some bone regeneration. Otherwise, we could do immediate loading on this implant, something that we cannot do with the sinus lift, for example. And... Uh, the question is, do, the, do things uh, go against each other? No, because I can tell you, there is a patient where we can do sinus lift and pterygoid implants in, in the same procedure. For example, this patient, she came to our attention that uh, she had the sinus lift before in the first quadrant, and when I met this patient, she had infection inside the sinus. So with Dr. Maza, we were uh, rinsing the sinus every two, three days. However, some part of the graft was left and two implants placed. No big deal with that. But what about the second quadrant? Here, my idea was to avoid the sinus lift and uh, place a pterygoid implant. However, prosthodontist didn't allow me because he doesn't want to connect, of course, the teeth with the implant. So we also place, he asked for sinus lift and one implant. I talked with the patient and she agreed once more to try also the sinus lift, but the new implant as well. Also because there was one tooth for extraction. So here we are at the day of the surgery. We this, this tooth is, remember, for extraction, but we have no problems. We can still make a bridge because she will have a full mouth reconstruction. We look at our tuber, we open the flap, and this is what I was telling you. Here we usually have a wide bone. Yes, so 4.7 millimeters, we usually can place it. And here we have our osteotomy, sinus lift, very good implant put in place. Don't be afraid by seeing the external hexagon because this is the old type of bibidental implant. Now they have the same internal hexagon of the other implants. We put the standard one and we have it on the x-ray. Yes, and now she's ready for the prosto. So if you want to see how does it look like from a, a, a practical point of view when we are drilling in this area, here we have it. So you see, we go posteriorly, immediately, with a 15 degrees, yes? And this is the part of the drilling, and that's when we are putting down our implant. Uh, a few words when we are drilling for this kind of implants, we are drilling very slowly. First of all, because irrigation doesn't get to the tip of a burr. Second of all, because we are going through a very specific kind of bone. So we are starting when we, are, we have a free we have a pilot drill from a 600, RP, 600 RPMs, and every drill we do 50% of that speed. So where we are going in with our 4.7 drill, we are drilling at 150 RPMs. And what about this patient? This patient that came to the office already had the two implants, ready for the bridge, and for some reason, afterwards, he had some lesion on this tooth, and this tooth needed to be extracted. So, because this, in the lower arch, we have till the tooth number seven, because he's a patient that uh, has a very big forces of mastication, the idea was to place two implants with a sinus lift. 
However, because of these big forces of mastication that we have seen during the uh, analysis, the, the diagnostic, the idea was to get more support. And this is what I'm telling you, that sinus lift and pterygoid implants, they don't go against each other. And here we have it. On the day of the surgery, we open our flap, we open the sinus on the same procedure. And we are able to do, to place, to drill for our pterygoid implants, open the sinus, drill for a standard implant, and that's what we did. We placed the period implant material in the sinus where we will place an implant at a different day because there was only one millimeter of bone and a standard implant in the tooth number five. And this is how it looks radiographically. So as you see, we can do both procedures at the same time. And why we can also use this implant for our patient, what is a, uh, could be an alternative for our patient? How many of you have a patient with a, a metal bar in the front because they have four implants, for example, because they had no bone in the posterior area, they didn't want the sinus lift? And this is the case of this patient. This is the model I was showing you before. This is a patient that was very well rehabilitated. In the lower arch, she has a fixed bridge on many implants, but in the upper arch, he only has four implants. And he has enough of his metal bar, even if it's perfectly made, everything is fine. He doesn't want to wear the denture. So what can we do in this case? Also in this case, you see how much, how big are the tissues in this area. So we can place in the posterior area some pterygoid implants and in the area of tooth number five, some more implants so that we have enough support. And what I was telling you before about the topography of this implant is that the last part of it is smooth. Why? Because of the angulation that we are placing it, not all of this implant will be inside the bone. Because if you are placing this implant with a 70, with, this was with 45 degrees angle, yes? However, this part of the implant will stay outside. So we need something that is biologically compatible with the soft tissue. And this is one of the prerequisites we said about implantology. Then we put the standard implants in the more uh, mesial part, and that's how it looks like afterwards. So now we have enough support. This patient, without sinus leaf, without anything, is able to get a fixed restoration. You see, when we had the four implants in the front, we couldn't place two implants in the backwards. It would be too long, the difference between the implants and the, the posterior support. So we added these two implants here, yes, besides the work that he has in the lower arch. If you ask me how I would treat this patient nowadays with the knowledge that we have now, well, I would go completely different. This is something that with Simone we were seeing when we were in China, it's something that I learned with them and that I'm trying to experiment in the near future, is that the standard placement of the four implants in the premaxilla, we tilting the last two implants and find the support in the posterior area. This kind of rehabilitation is quite interesting and has a specific name that is called because of shape of the implants V2V. And I think this is something that in the future is worth a trying. As I said before, we need evidence. We need to know that we can use these implants. And I already told you that since 1989, they've been placing many of them. And we find them in literature. We find literature with more than 500 implants, 300 implants. And what is the big difference when we are comparing especially the this kind of implants with the sinus, traditional sinus lift, is that we can immediately load the implants. And second of all, most important, is the amount of implants that we are losing. We are losing a very small amount of implants. Why? Because we are engaging a very big bone. We are engaging in a bone where we find the mechanical stabilization of the implant. And uh, when we look at the meta-analysis, that they are the most important studies, we will find out that with 1,300 implants, the success rate was extremely high. So is it safe to use them? It's very safe. I can also show you the result that we made with Professor Zupa. We, we studied 51 implants for five years at this point, and we lost two of them. We tried to see the difference in the angulation, and we see that angulation was not a problem. We found that our average was 58 degrees, so we are in line with the study that we have seen before and we lost only two implants. And we lost the implants during the healing phase, and most of the times this was the construction that we did. So two pterygoid implants and just four in the front to remove the bars. So what are the advantages of these solutions? 
And this is one take home message that is to overcome anatomical limitations. They are one step surgery. They have a very low failure after loading. If you think the literature, now is a, there is a big follow up, and there's very low failure around a few implants here and there. And this gives us the chance to have more fixed solution and avoid cantilevers. I don't like cantilevers on the implants. And it can be used with the Yuxta implants, and we are going now this direction to see that, and they get very high primary stability because they engage the hard bone. Of course, there are some negative things, and this is that it requires surgical skills because you are working in a different area where we don't feel very comfortable at the beginning. And most of all, we have no real visualization of the structures. Different implants. However, do I need different components to restore this implant? And the answer is no. This is the same hexagon that we found in 3P line, EV line, wide line. So you already have everything in your office. The only thing that is changing is the abutments, that are 40 degrees abutment, or the multi-unit abutments at 40 degrees, because we have to overcome the angle. And not least, the difference is the impression. This was the talk we had with Claudio one evening. In the morning, he came back. We already had the plan for the new <laughs> instrument. And this was the transfer. So if we have our implant placed around 45 degrees, about 60 degrees, we, it's very difficult to place a straight transfer and get a good impression. So here you have it. This one is a special transfer. It's a 30 degrees transfer to take the impression. What is nice, because thanks to this one, when you remove this one, it will be much easier. It's already simulating the, your multi-unit abutment, or if you want, for your normal abutment at 40 degrees. So it's much easier for your lab and for you to take the precise impression, because we need to have a precise impression. So what is the take-home message? Is that pterygoid implant insertion is an alternative to avoid sinus lifting, or together with sinus lifting, or avoiding any grafting procedures. There you go, implant especially used in partial edentalism to avoid distal cantilevers. And the place of the go, implant requires surgical experience. And last but not least, they have very high success rate, especially in low complication and good patient accept acceptation. I don't have problem with patient acceptation because for them, it's important that I restore them, not how. And I will go very quickly because I'm already over time. <laughs> but uh, if you want to see these uh, cases that I'm going to show you now, uh, made with uh, Professor Zuppa in Genova, and these are patients with big uh, atrophy. This atrophy is what we unfortunately have a lot in, uh, in Poland, but this is also in Italy. And this is the design of a superiostial implant. As you see, I told you before that we have three buttresses, and this, we are going to engage all of them. So we are going to use the canine buttress with you, together with the palate and the zygomatic buttress. And here's the plan of the grid as we see it from the side. At this point, after the planning, we are ready to go with the surgery, opening of a flap, full thickness flap, opening of the... Chinching. And then afterwards, we are able, we have to remove the incisor of papilla, we localize the palatine artery, and at this point we place in the premaxilla four implants because there was enough bone. But to have a fixed solution, we need to find something more. And this was the placement of a superiostial implant, as you see, engaging all the palate and the zygoma, with abutment already in place so that after the procedure, this is how the patient looks like. The healing abutment, the abutment from the grid, and we are able to place immediately the temporary denture. And this is how it looks like the patient after one day, and this is when we see it. Of course, they were added to pterygoid implants to find posterior support. This is how it looks the patient after the procedure. I'm not going to detail into this topic. I hope it is something maybe we can discuss next year. And this is the provisional restoration place on this structure. What about different cases? Finisco. <laughs> Here's a patient, very nice picture, also with the denture in place, yes, during the panoramic. However, you can believe in that she has a very big atrophy, and you can see from the printed model. Once you see the printed model, this is the template that we are using for the future grid, as was showing yesterday Angelo, that is using during the procedure. And here was so poor the bone that the decision was to put 
the implant in the spinal bone of the, of the, spinal, of the spine of the nose. Then our grid, you can find the anchorage in the canine pillar, palate, and zygoma. You can see here, yes? In the zygomatic process. And at this point, we have our grid in place with two pterygoid implants. And this patient, even if it's 75 years old, will have a restoration that we'll have to, now we'll have to live till 200 years old to use it, to finish it. Lower arch, six straight implants, normal implants, and the final restoration with the bridges on top, delivered after a few months. You can ask, this is the typical question, and somebody was already asking me yesterday, do we have any evidence about these cases? And these cases before, with Professor Zupa were operating with uh, Mauro Cerea, that is the biggest expert that you can find, my mentor also, that you can, not, you can find about this kind of implants, and they published this article with 70 patients, but they have much bigger experience with this kind of implants, and you can find the follow-up the complications. And you will find out that after follow-up, even of 15 years, these um, implants, they are working very well. And if you re read this article, you will find the process is with the uh, laser sinterization and uh, the, all the production is made in digital, following digital so that we can print immediately also the, our temporary bridge for the patient. So, what are the perspectives for the future? What are we going to do now? And this is the, now with Professor Enzelek, what we are going to do the, in a couple of weeks, are two more patients with the grids. As you can see here, one will be a full one, like on the right side, and on the left side, we will have two separate ones because the patient still has the teeth in the front. And it's much easier to place one grid instead of, uh, two grids instead of one full one. So we finished the project, the things are right already to our office, and the 17th of January will be the day that we will do these two surgeries with Dr. Cerea. And uh, why is extremely important, just one word, why is extremely important to do the planning, with the 3D planning? Why is changing nowadays the placement of these implants? Big difference with what was a few days ago, a few years ago, is that we can plan completely the position of the screws that we are going to use and the length of our screws. As you see, we already know where they're going to be and how long they can be. So there is a thorough planning. Before doing the surgery, there is two months of preparation for that, at least two months. And just to tell you, like BMB had a very long journey, very long way. I also have, I'm at the beginning of my journey, but this is my first patient when I placed the standard implants and already look like a very complicated procedure, yes? And thank God she's still alive. So I hope in the future there will be much more to come. And uh, a few things that happened in these years is uh, with Professor Enzel, we've been visiting many conferences like South America to the final one that we just came back with uh, Simone from uh, China. Uh, I hope I was able to clarify for you this topic. Yes, if you have any question for me, I will be at your full disposal. Yes, so thank you very much. Thanks, Marco. Thank you for the good presentation. Uh, this is the, uh, the present for you. Uh, so maybe I will be on time okay. now. Okay, beautiful yes. presentation, <laughs> and thanks for this. It's a little suggestion to, for you to be on time. You know, on time. Thank you.